speaker at the Vintage Computer Festival Midwest, the first annual Vintage Computer Festival Midwest, is going to be Ray Borel. He comes from Bloomington, Indiana, and here he is. Well, this talk is supposed to be about early days in retailing, but we'll start with two poems, or several poems, so two poems, but my, my favorite, and if anybody was at VCF 6 in the West Coast, or 5, I don't remember, they, they've heard it. This is uh, Data Matron. Gung-ho automation and dinner gets cold while daddy's debugging the mama and mommy grows old. Along with our offspring and members of memories pr pr proficient of times when by hand was considered sufficient. I too have a memory with stored information of years of togetherness pre-automation. A girl from the office I'd know how to fight, but that's not where daddy is spending the night. I've lost it, I know it. He thinks it's fun. Say, how do you poison a 1401? That came out of datamation in about 1961. And I say, you have to read it any of these things because everything changes and nothing changes. We're still making widow wives. <laughs> I'll leave these out. People can read them after Thursday. Around. I brought these along to demonstrate, if you've never seen one, what it took to solder all the connectors on an MSI motherboard or an Altair, which wasn't as big. This is a Kremenko, and it's only got 21 slots on it. This is a speech lab kit, as it came from the factory in 1976. And it even has, still has the paper tape software that came with it. Um, this one is probably elegant. It has two manuals. Most of them had much less than two manuals. Some of them a couple of sheets stapled together. I brought along a, a couple of other things that I, are my souvenirs. This is a robot I sold. And this is a, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's the original Nova. Uh, I was one of the first 10 people other than uh, general, uh, data general people that was trained on that machine. These two books are from uh, General Automation and they're uh, written by Osborne Associates. And, and they're dated, I think, 1972, 73, uh, which demonstrates that Adam was in the book writing business a long time before he was in the computer business or in the, in the, uh, 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 editorial writing business. I started, well, I go back to, to uh, my first digital experience goes back to about 1956 when I went to work for Brookhaven National Lab after I got out of the Army. And we built most of the stuff that you needed for nuclear research by hand because you couldn't buy it in those days. Uh, pulse height analyzers and time of flight analyzers, you name it. And we built them from scratch. Just we took the engineer sketch and went and got all the parts out of the store, uh, supply, and, and built them. And they were all vacuum tube. The biggest one I ever built had, I think, 100, 212 vacuum tubes, and uh, it, it, it was a, a wired computer because it had memory and everything else. For display, we used usually uh, Tektronix uh, scopes, XY scopes, and for uh, printers. You, you name it, we'd, we'd, we'd put solenoids on adding machines. Um, we'd use key punches with solenoids added on the keyboards. Uh, you, you, you just couldn't buy any printers, so we made them. A couple of years after I went to work there, I decided to, I, I missed the service. I had spent almost 10 years between the National Guard and the regular Army, and I joined the Air Force. And because of a few things, I qualified for a uh, classified computer course, and I uh, got the highest grade they ever had in that course up to that time, at least. I don't know what they did after I left. And so they gave me my choice of uh, Yak, Montana, Minot, North Dakota, or Crookston, Minnesota, which is way the hell up in the corner near Minot, or stay there as an instructor. So even Keesler sounded good compared to that. So I, uh, they, they said, well, we're going to see if you're going to make an instructor put your hands in your pocket. And I said, surface, put your hands in your pocket? My God. And they said, now describe a spiral staircase. And uh, 
I guess I satisfied because they sent me to instructor school. And I got out of that and did it again with the highest grades they ever had. So I instructed through the computer. The first 12 weeks of that course was electronic fundamentals, but um, I picked up a class when they were in the first couple phases of, of uh, the computer's portion, instructed through it once. In the meantime, my wife, we had one son at the time, and my wife became pregnant, and, and, and our airman second spade didn't cut it. And you couldn't get a promotion in there, if you, even if you were a current, current hero. So uh, I uh, applied for a hardship discard, discard and got out uh, about 15 months after I went in. And back to Brookhaven Lab, where I worked a year in, in high energy, but I uh, was thinking I was losing the advantage I had learned in, in computers, and computers were the thing to be in in those days, so I went out and worked for uh, Royal McBee on uh, LZP-30, where it's here somewhere, which was my first uh, commercial computer. Well, yeah, it's here. And uh, I worked f for them and for uh, another company called Advanced Scientific Instruments, which was a brand new company. Uh, L Royal McBee's computers were all drum computers, and I wanted to get into a computer that had core memory, and uh, which was beginning to show up a lot. I, my, uh, I saw a went to we had a, this exhibit at a cartographer's convention in Washington, and I think it was 1960 or, or the winter of 60 61. And at the, we were setting up our booth, and down at the long, down at the end of the aisle there, I heard music playing, and went down there, and it was the first computer I'd heard play music other, outside of the old radio trick. And it was a PDP-1 playing Bach Fugues. And so, and it was one of Deck's first exhibits of PDP-1. And uh, I think that was in, in the winter of 60, 61. Anyway, I went to work for Advanced Scientific Instruments, and I, <laughs> you ever hear of a kludge? Picture a machine that's got connectors that are miracle inventions by the company that if you plug or unplug them 25 times, it ruins the board. That's a sales advantage, <laughs> okay? Now, we put a burpee punch in it, and we put a fuse on every punch magnet because we're ruining punch magnets too fast. But they're between two rows of cards, and the cards stick out about that far, about that far. So you can't get your fingers down. There are three AG fuses. You can't get <laughs> turn them. You got to pull all the cards out, and you got to pull out two rows of cards to get at them. Change one fuse, put it back, <laughs> and go again. This is a kludge. It's got a memory in it that is required to be in an oven oven because it's a new type of memory that is uh, only requires two wires. But the, I'm not sure I'm going to describe this right because it's about how many years ago. Um, it depended upon the switching diode the, being being having a latency in them. They they they, do, they don't switch as fast as they tell you they switch. There's a delay in them, and that's when you sense the, the wire for for the inhibit. And. It requires now that we've got it invented. It was invented at the University of Illinois. <laughs> now we've got it working. We have to put it in an oven because it's, it's the, temp, the damn diode is heat sensitive. <laughs> and so I have, and I have to go in every morning in, in the one at Goddard Space Flight Center and tweak the memory to get it to work all day. It's, it, incidentally, it's during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the computer's in a bomb shelter. And my wife's sitting home wondering where, where she's going to be at the end of this 50 megaton bomb. <laughs> Cruise ship's banging. So. And uh, the, uh, then I got one up at Aberdeen Proving Ground, 60, 75 miles away. And it's in a room where the sun gets to shine at about 11 o'clock in the morning. So I got to go up there and tweak that memory, to make it work <laughs> long enough. Well, anyway, the ASI 210 was a kludge, no doubt about it. And I went up, took, I got so tired, I just went up to, now I have to tell you something. I, my dog's in there. I have narcolepsy and cataplexy. I've had it all my life. Narcolepsy, uh, 
I won't go to sleep up here, but put me behind the wheel and I will. And uh, I've probably driven more miles sound asleep than a lot of you've driven coke. <laughs> I just quit driving about four years ago, so. Um, cataplexy is something, a complication in narcolepsy. And any kind of a, of a, of a stress change, good or bad, uh, sometimes I just think of a wise track, track and it hits will drop me in my tracks because I, I, you just lose every muscle, you just turn to jelly and boom. That's why the, the walker. And uh, so I might want to warn you, if I start to go, let me know. <laughs> I'll be down there. But, uh, uh, yeah, somebody come and keep me from cracking my head up because I, I take Coumadin for my heart and if, they, if I crack my head, they got to take me off and do a CAT scan and I can't do that because I got a pacemaker. So it's uh, very complicated. Where was I? Oh, I got really tired, and I went back up to Long Island for a four-day weekend. And on the Monday of the fourth day, four-day weekend, I went up to Brookhaven Lab to see my old friends. I really didn't have any intention of having anything happen. I just wanted to see them. And I walked in, and the chairman of the department, Willie Higginbotham, anybody hear Willie Higginbotham? He invented Pong. That's a minor thing. He was also on the Presidential Science Advisory Council for four, four administrations. He was uh, one of the original people who worked on the bomb. He was uh, chairman, of, he was founder and chairman of the uh, Association of American Scientists. Uh, he, he was a genius and everybody in the world loved him. He, uh, I don't know what he saw in me when he gave me my first job. I had gone, been through the fixture station radio receiver repair school at Fort Monmouth. And so help me, the only reason I passed that course is because I was a top three grader and everybody else was peons. And because I, if I wasn't asleep in the course, they were putting air conditioning in all the new buildings and the drills were always working right under us, the diamond, concrete drills and diamond drills. So I couldn't hear or I was asleep. And I, <laughs> I had no more deserve to pass that course. And he gave me a job anyway as a technician B trainee the first time. Uh, I came back and he gave me another job. I came back third, well they grabbed me at that time and said we we're starting a new group to do uh, some new, new kinds of computer systems and we, we need somebody to, we want to keep maintenance in house and we want somebody that, that knows what they're doing and you want the job. And I kind of hesitated 30, 40 microseconds and said sure. And that Friday I was in California at School of Scientific Data Systems and <laughs> they even moved us up when we weren't there from, from Washington back up to Long Island. So we got ashtrays full and butter plates full and stuff when, when they unpacked. That lasted about five years and we did some interesting stuff. It was the most fascinating, productive, fun, self-satisfying job I ever had in my life. Sorry I ever left the place. And uh, me and the guy that started the group left at the same time. He went to Scientific Data Systems as Vice President of Programming. And I'm pretty sure when, when uh, Jobs and, and Crowd, Jeff Raskin and people were uh, looking around at the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, he was the director at that time. But anyway, the, he left and I left. And I went to work for a manufacturer. And the only thing interesting that, about that is that, as I said before, I was one of the first 10 people trained on, on data general machines. And while well, part of the training, I noticed that there was a trick in it. They, they, um, to keep the cost down, a, a word coming out of memory, a 16-bit word coming out of memory, is not didn't come out in 16 bits parallel. It came out four bits parallel as uh, Ed DeCastro called it, a, a nibble, N-Y-B-B-L-E, <laughs> parallel. And I said, gee, that's clever. Uh, I've seen that before. He said, what? I said, yeah, the, the SDS 920 was serial by bit, and the 930, 940, 9300, 925 were all serial by octal digit. And he said, good God, I thought I invented it. <laughs> and. I thought he, he might get mad at me having said something, but uh, he didn't. He, he, I guess he liked me all right because I, I can call him to this day and talk to him. 
uh, then from there I went out and, and was co-founder of, of uh, ADS, Applied Digital Data Systems, a company that I uh, named and got the principles together, and including the guy that had the money. And um, started complaining about the design of our first terminal from day one. It wasn't didn't look anything like I thought it should, and said it once too often and got invited to leave after three years. <laughs> so I didn't become a millionaire. They did. The rest of them did. I, I think one guy, last guy I saw in the, in the Wall Street Journal, sold the last of his stock for twelve and a half million. So, and I got about I got three quarters of a million, I guess. Enough enough to start a computer store and lose it. <laughs> From there, I went to uh, Indiana University. I worked in psychology for three years. And when the Altair came out, I got excited. And I said in here, I was going to tell you a secret that I had never even told my family. And that is, the reason I really wanted a computer was I thought, if I could get some uh, EEG transducers, whatever, it's not the word, it's electrodes, um, I could monitor my brain waves, and when I, I didn't know what I had till I never got diagnosed till I was almost 40 years old. So I didn't know. I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know what it was. I'd ever had every physical test known to me, and I thought it, I thought it was psychological, and I really thought I may be nuts, but I'm no, I'm harmless, so I'm not going to let that bother me. And uh, I thought if I could monitor my brain waves, I'd get. There must be when it starts to occur, there must be some early warning. They must change, and if I could get get that early warning, I could make some sort of a helmet or something that when I drove or, saw, or did something important that would give me a warning. And that's what I wanted a computer for. Of course, I've, now it's how many years later and I still don't have a computer for it. But, uh, and I also wanted to get a piece of the action. I, I just watched it till September when Byte came out and I found that there was a computer store in Los Angeles, the first one. and. I thought, no, that's for me. I had thought something about doing something like that way back in deck edu systems days. And it also said they were going to sponsor a uh, deck, was, I mean, a bite was going to sponsor a conference in Kansas City to try to establish some standards for re recording digital data on, on uh, audio tape with the idea that, that if they, everybody, Went with the standard, they can uh, interchange software easy, or a lot easier. Uh, and of course, by the time Noble Goal got into the, went to the conference, I was the only one there that didn't represent some company. And uh, it, there was a lot of talk going on, but nothing happened because everybody already had a card or they had, had one on the drawing boards and they didn't want to <laughs> change it. So everybody went their own way. I think. Processor Tech and somebody else were the only ones that stuck with it. But I met Ed Roberts. I met people from Comemco and the people from Processor Technology and um, uh, John Lancaster and and uh, Don Tarbell and a whole bunch of people, and came away thinking I've got to open a computer store. That's all there is to it. Well, that was November, and it took me till, till February to do it. And I uh, made a trip to the coast and signed up for as a, as a dealer for uh, Comemco and Processor Tech and IMSI. And I, I think I'm the only one that ever did IMSI out of out of out of, out of Ed Faber's sneaky sneak attack. They wanted to get discounts. They wanted 10% uh, up front on 50 machines. And they'd give you 25% total on the 50 machines, and they'd pay the shipping. So I said, all right, I'll give you 15% on 100 machines, but you can't change the price that I'm paying when you raise the price, the, the list price. I keep my current price. And I'll, uh, and I'll take it, but I want, I, I want it, I want it in, on paper. And he put it on paper, and I got it. And they raised prices three times that year. So by the end of the year, I was making good money on the upside. <laughs> and 
went from there. I opened uh, on the 12th of February, 1976. I have a running argument with Stan Veit, who at one place claims he was the second store in the world, and I don't know what he counts the bite shop and all those uh, uh, outside dealers that were out there already. I figure I was probably somewhere between 12 and 20. And another place he claims he opened on February 10th. And I sat at a conference one day and told me he opened on March 1st. So I don't know. We argue about who was 10th or 12th or whatever. <coughs> and um, then it was a question of what to sell. We only had Cremento's and uh, and they didn't have a computer yet. They had car some cards. And, and Processor Tech, and they didn't have a computer yet. And they had just memory cards and a, a Phantom 3 PPOSS and a Phantom VEM1. And so I, we went around looking. And uh, we signed up for every computer magazine. It wasn't all back issues. Uh, all the books we could find that people were advertising. Um, anything we could get out of t-shirts and everything else out of creative computing. And we even found a place up in, in uh, yeah, Ball State University. I don't know, up, up the up, town here. And uh, they were selling computer-generated artworks. And we bought a bunch of them, put them on the walls, and went to work. And <laughs> it was unbelievable. I, I, I realized later that maybe the trouble was I opened a retail store, I assumed that one carried inventory, where I think most dealers did just like the manufacturers. They got the orders first, and then they went to order the inventory. But I had, you know, I'd order 15 of each card and this and that. Of course, everything came in COD. Everything, nothing would, would no, no, no uh, vendor would, would schedule deliveries. There was no net 30. I remember the day my first Sol 20s came in, and the UPS call said, we got a COD over here. We'll keep it for two days, and we'll send it back. I said, OK, how much? $54,800 COD. <laughs> All the money was mine. The banks well, well, give us a pro forma and give us the figures from other businesses of similar nature. I said, well, there are no other businesses of similar nature. And how am I going to press this to me? What's going to happen here in a business, in an industry that didn't even exist six months ago? Wouldn't give me any money. Wouldn't even, even back a uh, 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 small business administration loan. They said they didn't want to bother with the paperwork. They would loan all their money out they, they had. Um, I was from Long Island, and I was used to being able to get money pretty easy for new startups, but not here, boy, not here, no way. And on it went like that, and, and, but we, we, found, we, we were invited to a meeting up here, up in Chicago, to the Chicago area computer hobbyist exchange, cash, and discovered that they didn't have a dealer up there that, that was, um, carrying any inventory, so they came to us. And they, I was talking, that first six months, we had customers from Guam to Saudi Arabia and from Alaska to, to Brazil uh, and all over the United States. Florida State University was a good customer for a long while. Um, I, <laughs> it was kind of fantastic. And, and, and we were having fun and we were working. Oh, 7 in the morning till 7.30 at night for me was pretty regular, seven days a week. Uh, for my guys, now my guys, I think a lot of computer stores were this way, I'm not alone, but so people would walk in to see what was going on, start asking intelligent questions, sit down and look around and start reading a book or something and stay for months to years. And that's where I got most of my employees. Uh, one of them co-authored that book. Uh, one of them wrote the CPM book from, that Osborne Associates published uh, on my time with my equipment. Didn't even put me in acknowledgments, I think. Um, 
one of them became the first Wizard of Osborne. He, I got a poster I meant to bring uh, of him. He, he uh, designed the double density and the uh, 80 column display for the Osborne one, the, the retrofit. And uh, in the process, designed that disc controller so you could translate a dozen formats uh, or more. There was no five and a quarter inch format you couldn't translate. This is years later, they gradually wandered away. They, they, they were so loyal, they used to come to me and say, I've been offered this job, do you think I should take it? Uh, you know, and I used to tell them, look, any, anybody in the computer business that stays in one company for five years or more, year has equity, or well, they're no good. <laughs> if somebody offers you a better job than you got, grab it. And I hated to give them up because they were good. By that time, I was selling alpha microsystems, and uh, I needed a lot of software support. Mike Swain was my software support for the office for a while. And uh, so was uh, Roy Robinson, who became the guy, never been out of Indiana in his life, and he became the guy that traveled all over the world teaching Osborne's foreign reps about the Osborne hardware and software. He's now, I think, Weiss Technologies, um, oh, web administrator. And I think he's still at it for after five or six years. Um, we had a guy that came in that was named John. What's John's last name? Can't think of it. God, total blank. Um, he came in and, and, and got to hanging around, bought an apple, then he got to hanging around the place until one day his wife says, either give him a job or throw him out. <laughs> so he went to work part-time as, as an apple salesman. And so helped me, if somebody came in that store looking for a computer, if John got them, they bought an apple. I don't care if they needed an alpha micro with 16 terminals on it, they bought an apple. <laughs> he could sell an apple to anybody. He, he was something else. And he was the director of quality control for picture troops for RCA. It wasn't like he really needed the job. He was making plenty of money. He was a Purdue graduate. And uh, I heard from him recently, he's still, still the same. He's, he's, he's retired, he's living in a mobile home, traveling all over the country, but he's got his computer and his internet connection via the airwaves <laughs> all over. Um, in, in, in uh, what was it, March, late, late March of 76, where they had the first World Out There convention, and I went, and there was some interesting applications. Of course, MITS wouldn't let anybody but Out There exhibit. Even, even people made compatible boards. They, he called them uh, parasites. And, uh, but some of the applications that the, the Out There was being put to, even then, with with minimal memory that worked, and, and, and that kind of stuff. And done by teenage kids, had them talking and singing, and all kinds of applications you would never think anybody would have time to do, let alone get it working. And at the meeting, I met some guys from Chicago, among them Ted Nelson. Anybody familiar with Ted Nelson? He wrote a book called Computer Lib Dream Machine. His mother was Celeste Holm, and his father was the, uh, Nelson that directed The Lilies of the Field and a couple other movies. <laughs> Certifiably nuts, I suspect. He uh, wrote a book called Computer Lib Dream Machine. It was one of these back to back, looked like a whole Earth catalog. And he invented hypertext. His, he could conceived of hypertext before anybody else, I think. He, uh, very bright, but he, he was this guest speaker at the, at the luncheon. And he had an audience, a room about maybe this size, maybe a little bigger, jam-packed full. Men and women, kids, no, I don't think about kids, men and women. And he talked about the, the great potential for digital things in, in, in uh, uh, 
marital aids, <laughs> things like that, for an hour and had that whole audience in stitches. <laughs> and he didn't buy didn't bat an eyelash. He kept on talking. And I got to talking to him afterwards, and it turned out that he was going to start a business in Chicago called Itty Bitty Machine Company. Little I, little B, little bit of him. And uh, he had heard that I had the gift of gab and could sell computers. And well, the, the upshot of the thing was that we were to merge the two companies together in, in the future. And when we did, I'd become the president and CEO. And uh, uh, until then, I'd be responsible for choosing all the product they sold and we sold. It never happened, but it never happened because of the way the market went. Ted, uh, everybody thinks that was a big deal, but it, it really, <laughs> Really, nothing much happened. Everybody was too busy. We did we did share a booth at the Atlantic City Convention and sold a lot of computers. Between it, well, I got it, it favor to, to give them the same deal he gave me, except at the price at the time, which was a couple of raises after mine. And they signed up for 100 machines. And of course, they probably didn't sell 25 of them. I probably sold 75 of them. And I wondered how I could up the margins on, on the darn things. Well, I'd been in electronics for a long time, so I started calling around the country, and I found a guy that would make, uh, sell me uh, edge connectors, both uh, the pin configuration on the Altair board was a little different than the inside boards. So I got him to sell me the edge connectors for both for about $2 a connector. Inside was getting 18, I think, or 15, and, and uh, Altair was getting more than that. And uh, I just tripled my money and said, I'll sell them for that. And, and I'll, I'll call that a discount offer at an emphasized price, of course. And I sold, and I sold all the uh, uh, Altair connectors to other, other Altair dealers at a nice price so they could make some money. Then I discovered Imsai would sell you a muffin fan, cooling fan, four inch cooling fan for $25. And it was a 40 CFM fan. And I just called around again and found some 110 CFM fans I could get for $4 a piece. So I made some money off them too. And I made, had a local glass, uh, deal to make, make uh, uh, cl classic tops for the inside and for the, for the out there so people could look in and see what they look like inside. And uh, I think he charged me $13 a piece for them, and I sold them retail for 75 bucks and, and, and sold them to other, the out there dealers for $50. And the same thing happened with keyboards. We started putting VDM ones in, in for display. Never used any MSI boards. They were terrible. <laughs> CPU and the, and, the, and the front panel. And we, processor tech memories or seals memories or vector graphic memories or something. And um, VDM ones, mostly, or Vector Graphics later on made a better video board. It was an 80 column display and had a keyboard interface on it. And three P plus S's for the I.O. and, and, and uh, keyboard interface. And we found surplus key keyboards from, that were uh, surplus from Texas Instruments, Silent 700 terminals for uh, 17 to 22 dollars a piece and we got 45 to 60 dollars a piece for them. and uh, just things like that that's up, up the margins but to tell you the truth well the next thing was a Midwest Association of Computer Clubs meeting on the 12th and 13th of June 76 and we loaded up my pickup and drove over there with everything in the store that we couldn't sell and went to that thing. Expected a few hundred people. There were almost 5,000. We were, didn't have, bring any change, forgot all about change. So we were gonna go to the bank first thing in the morning and get some change. And we came down and had some breakfast and we went over to the booth and we're just hanging around the booth 
waiting for the banks to open and the doors open. And you know, the usual hit the fan. We didn't have a cash box. The money was just laying loose on the, on the, on the table. And they bought everything we had, everything, in one day. It was a two-day show. There was a guy there selling disk drives. He started off at $600 a piece. And by the time they quit, he was selling for, for uh, 495 a piece, I think. But he sold over 600 of them. And there was no controllers. There was no CPM. There was no nothing at that time. And the, the place was just insanity the whole two days. We shared a booth with Processor Tech, who showed some stuff. And, and uh, I think you read, read there, it says in there that they showed their uh, Sol 20, which I was positive of and ensured Mike that, that Stan Reed was wrong. It wasn't at the Atlantic City Convention. And on and on and on. And I got to talking to uh, Lee Felsenstein about six months ago. He said, Ray, it could not have been the VDM one, I mean, the Sol 20, because we didn't have the power supply work until the end of June, uh, until the end of July. And uh, so he convinced me I was a liar. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, I've never been wrong before. Oh, well, once I thought I was wrong, but I was right. So I called Mike, emailed Mike Swain and told him, Mike, I'm a liar. And uh, he just got back and said, well, the next, next edition, we'll, we'll straighten that out. Atlantic City was mostly um, stuff from Itty Bitty. And, and oh, the funniest part of that was we sold a computer and some boards to a kid with a credit card. And we were sure his credit card was right because his name was Pierre Dupont III. And he was from Delaware. And he was a student in some exclusive school in Connecticut. And he had a kid with him who he talked us into selling him some stuff. Well, the other kid's credit card cleared, but his didn't. And it didn't clear, and it didn't clear. And I was going to write it. His father was a congressman. I was very ready to call, call him and ask him about it. And it finally cleared. It was about almost two months. And lo and behold, in Dr. Dobbs' journal is this letter from Pierre Dupont III saying, what a terrible deal he made. I finally got my computer working, and what a terrible deal he made with some rinky-dink computer store in Bloomington, Indiana, uh, that he thought he was going to have to bring the law on to get his cards that he <laughs> ordered at the show. I said, you little funk, I'd like to get you and kick your butt. But nothing further was heard. And I was suffering from, I don't know. I was very depressed at the time. And I had lunch with Don French, the guy that did the, the trash aiding. And I had this card with me. And it's got the little, little CRT guy on it. He said, that's cute. Where's, who did that for you? And I said, I don't know. I, I can't remember. But one of my guys got it. And uh, I said, take one and use it if you want to. I, you know, Nobody will finance me. I'm going to be out of business and nothing flat anyway. And if you look at the, hand, the manual for the, the original manual for the TRS-80, there's a little, little CRT guy that does all the walking around and talking around. And the only difference is, that his head is separate from his body, from his keyboard. And I, I do wonder to this day if that's where he got it. I just don't know. I've never seen him since, so I don't know. Uh, we went back to uh, good old Bloomington, and I knew, well, by that time it had dawned on me that if I wanted to increase business, I had to increase capitalization, so I'd throw some more money in. But, you know, I had, was limited. I <laughs> had sold two apartment complexes already. And uh, we wanted to open an Indianapolis store, and we had other people bugging us to open a store in Louisville, and uh, Lexington, and Lafayette. And 
I wanted to do it, and people say I wanted to out Terrell Terrell in the bike shop. Not so. I, I, I'm much too stupid for that. I wanted to because I wanted to keep our image. We had a good image, and I wanted to keep our image clean and, and, and have stores operated similar to the way we did, which was the customer's always right, and in this business, there's going to be a lot of things to correct. And you got to correct them, or, or and eat your mistakes, or you're not going to be there long. And so I, I really wanted to help these guys because I couldn't afford to do it. And uh, so I let them use the name, and I had them agree to buy stuff from me. But in several cases, they just ignored that. I used to get laughed at my bookkeeper would say the Louisville stores as clean as a whistle. Those guys, their books are just beautiful every month. Sure, they were beautiful. They were paying me for everything they took from the shop, but all the other rules they were violating and making, you know, and, and just cheating us out of, out of the piece of the action we were supposed to get. And also ordering things on their own. I found, when I finally closed the place because I couldn't afford to keep it open, I found months and months of back issues of magazines that they'd been ordering 25 and 50 more a month than I gave them. And that was getting charged to me. And uh, same thing with, with the Lafayette operation. Indianapolis went longer, but I, and I closed that out of lack of funds. I should have realized at the time that CPM came out and, and that first we get the first disk drive from, from digital research that I didn't have money enough for demos for that for those stores and, and closed them. I was lucky if I had money enough for demos for, for Bloom, Bloomington. And Bloomington was still going great guns and I was selling $50,000 over the tele telephone by myself, let alone other people. In the long run, I, like the man said before, I, I, I was a geek. I didn't know anything, well, me and everybody else didn't know anything about business. I uh, realized that I was working from insolvency, if not bankruptcy. And I, I stayed working from insolvency for a long time because I didn't know what to do. Uh, for example, with Cremenco, I had a deal. I'd sell a Cremenco machine. I'd call Harry Garland, the president of Cremenco, on the phone, and I'd say, Harry, I just sold the machine. He'd say, okay, well, you want to do the same deal as last time? Okay. He would, sell, he would ship the machine to the customer and get paid for it. He'd, he'd, my hunk of the action he would put in my account for the next time and tell me when it was in. And I never saw the machine, I was just like brokering it. And you, you can't treat a guy any better than that, you know, <laughs> really. And I finally decided that uh, I was gonna have to do something. Well, this guy came in and, and wanted to buy into the business. And I said, but he wanted, to, to know that he was getting the best of the deal. I, well, I, what, what it amounted to, I sold him 51% of the business and his promise to pay the current debts, which weren't bad, it was kind of running cash on the barrel head, and put up some money for opening some stores further, further south because I had talked to the people that had the computer land franchise for all southern Indiana. and. The, one of them was uh, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, um, and the other one was, was a big businessman in Indianapolis. They said that the s south of I-70 would be the last place they would go, and they would go sooner or later. But as far as they were concerned, it belonged to the data domain now, and they wouldn't touch it. So I wanted to get into Evansville and places like that before they could, could move. Well, it turned out that he and I, he was an engineer from Purdue. We got along good. But his wife didn't like me, and she ruled the roost. And boy, she, she, well, make a long story short, in about three months, they told me they liked the business, they thought it was doing good, but I should take a hike. 
So I uh, left the data domain in, in, in the end of February 82, and they put it out of business in seven months flat because they didn't understand the customers, and they drove the existing customers away like crazy just by the, they drove them all away. And they were all repeat customers. They'd been doing business for five years. Uh, Boots Manufacturing in Evansville had bought, I don't know how many apples and, and uh, MSI computers from me, and he bought two big alpha micros, multiple uh, six or eight terminals on each, and, and uh, uh, high-speed printer and a TI-810 printer, and half a megabyte of core, which I mean memory, which was big in those days. And he just drove him away. He wouldn't, you know. He, he called me one day and said, "I'm sorry, but I'm not doing business with Data Domain anymore. I'll get somebody else because those crazy people are crazy." Well, that was the story. Um, what I got up here is. Stuff. I got a few issues of the data domain newsletter, uh, some my old business cards, and uh, a Byte magazine, one of our ads in it. You can see a typical ad of uh, computer stores in those days, and the motherboard and the, and the kit. Some buttons out of my button collection I grabbed in five minutes this morning. I've got a button collection that goes back to 1963, I think at computer, national computer conventions, and I, it's, it's one of those big totes like this, full. And I mean really full. And I sold a bunch of them on, on eBay. I sold all the risque ones on eBay, unfortunately. It's 12, no, eight minutes before quitting time, and I'm quitting. A sly old coder of Stimper on his deathbed said with a simper, I shall rel relinquish life station with graceful degradation and not with a bang or a whimper. Well, to CE down in New Clare, this clues I can never repair. It, it's mean time to fail is of little avail since it's less than the time to repair. A digital gourmet at the Ritz said, my new menu will give them all fits. Card jam and tape punch, time slices too much, Gibson mix and binary bits. Said a data compressor whose job with the Library of Congress played hob, I reduced all of it down to one bit, which I can carry around in my fob. Said an X3, a stalwart of Nancy, I garner more talk, more I garner more folk than they fancy. If they play their own game and stick with the name, be it ASA, USA, SI, or ANSI. Used a linguist of wide reputation after moments of rapt contemplation of naughty graffiti on the walk of this city, one might call it Polish notation. <laughs> a programmer down in Moline said I'm the match for any machine. My secret aversion to loops and recursion, just acres of on inline routine. Brilliant stuff. That's the Churl's Garden of Verse, and I don't know what it's from. Something from September 1971. That doesn't even tell me. I've had it, you can tell, for a few years. This datamation one is getting so yellow. I can't copy it many more times. I changed the one, when I put that poem in my, in my uh, uh, newsletter, March, April 82, I put it in there. But instead of saying uh, a uh, 1401, I figured a lot of people really wouldn't have any idea what a 1401 was, so I changed it to Osborne 1. Say, how do I poison an Osborne 1? And that's about it. You want any questions? Questions? Jeez, all those hands up at once. Computer retailing in the, old, in the early days was just pure chaos, and the manufacturing was chaos. And the chaos made us all not anticipate what was coming. Um, so all we did was, was work in the chaos and have a lot of fun and work like hell. We, my wife used to think I'd never stand up to the stress, and the stress was just fun. Jeannie, were you around in those days? <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, she, she, yeah, so I brought home an apple with a, with a uh, graphic board, and she drew a, an Adidas, was it? She said, something Adidas. And I laughed and it looked cute, and I sent it to Apple, and I went, you know, I came in something similar from them. I wonder if they got it from her. Yeah, she was little then. She's got big now. That's my daughter, Jeannie. She just just maybe put on some weight. She got married in Key West and, and uh, we, in, in Hemingway's house, and we went down and had a lot of fun. It was the best blast I've been to since the Polish weddings when I was a kid. Hmm? Yeah. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs>